keynote. We're very excited about this lectureship. These last few lectures have been absolutely tremendous. We've all been encouraged by them, and we know that this will continue as these next few days go on. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Doug Burleson. Uh, this is a man that uh, I admire. I was very privileged to be able to take a few of his classes during my time at Freed Hartman University. Uh, one of my favorites being the Gospel of John. And I'm, I'm sure you remember uh, my struggle in that class for some time, but what you probably didn't know is that was probably during my lowest moment. And you know, the, the content of that class was not only academically challenging, but spiritually challenging as well. And the moment that I got to accept an internship, I knew exactly which direction I was going to go, and I'm forever thankful uh, for what I've learned from Dr. Burleson. Dr. Burleson has served as a professor of Bible and the director of the annual Bible lectureship at Freed Hardeman University since 2010. He's married to Chris, Christy Johnson Burleson, and they have four children. Doug is a graduate of Freed Hardeman and has, a master, has master's degrees from Freed Hardeman, Lipscomb, and New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary. Dr. Burleson also has a PhD in New Testament and Greek from the NOBTS, and he is a member of the Board of Directors for Lads to Leaders and began serving as one of the preachers at the Estes Church of Christ in Henderson, Tennessee in August of 2016. His favorite Bible verse is Isaiah 42 and verse 3. And he travels with his family, especially tent camping thus far in Arkansas, California, Kansas, Maine, Minnesota, Minnesota, Tennessee, and Wyoming. It's a lot of driving. <laughs> but Dr. Burleson is uh, a very honored guest here at Coley's Ridge College, and we trust that he'll do an amazing job with the text, as uh, he always does. And this will also be something very challenging and thought-provoking for all of us. But before Dr. Burleson gets up to uh, speak to us today, let's uh, start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for this lectureship. We thank you for the... Uh, many blessings that you've given to us so far, Lord. And as we enter into the song service, Lord, we ask you to be with our song leader. We ask of you to help us to be encouraged by the singing. We ask of you to uh, bless us, to fill us with your spirit, that we may lift your name on high, worshiping you in spirit and in truth. Lord, we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your revelation through your holy word. Lord, we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I did fail to mention that there will be a song service before this, so please, <laughs> so that's on me, but uh, whoever, our song leader will now begin the song service. <laughs> you know, if you feel like it, because it says we will stand, let's please stand. You're my brother, you're my sister, so take me by the hand. Together we will work until he comes. There's no foe that can defeat us when we're walking side by side. As long as there is love, we will stand. As long as there is love, we will stand. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior. Christ the Lord, bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of 
God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, resting in my Savior as my all in all, standing on the promises of God. And 
Jesus is his name. Faithful love is a friend just when hope seems to end. Welcome face, sweet embrace, tender touch filled with grace. Faithful love, endless power, living flame, spirit's fire, burning bright in the night, guiding my way. Faithful love, from above, he came to earth to show the Father's love. The 
joy of the Lord is my strength. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, think I've lost my way, still you're there. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. your silver and your gold. You may pile up all the riches that the sword nor can hold, but I'd rather have my Savior and with him firmly stand, or I won't be ready to meet him and the glory land. I want to be ready to meet him by and by. I want to be ready to meet him in the sky. Oh, I want to be more like him and to his blessed command, for I want to be ready to meet him in the glory land. You may talk about your riches, your diamonds and your pearls, you may gain the wealth for ages of this and all the worlds, but the Savior is more precious, with him I'll take my stand, for I want to be ready to meet him in the glory land. I want by and by. I want to be ready to meet him in the sky. Oh, I want to be more like him and to his blessed command. For I want to be ready to meet him in the glory land. Amen. If you feel like it, let's sing. There is beyond the azure blue a God concealed from human sight. He tinted skies with heavenly hue and framed the worlds with his great might. There is a God, he is alive. In him we live and we survive. From
Well, you sure know how to make a brother feel welcome. I know that. It's wonderful to be with you, and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for your hospitality and kindness. I'm so thankful that I've got so many friends here tonight, including former students uh, and some current students. If I started to name you, we'd be here a lot longer than we are planning on being here. Also, some last leaders friends. It's great to see many of you. We uh, go to the Little Rock Convention every year. But then uh, Crowley's Ridge, what a special place. I've been greetings from a fellow lighthouse, uh, Creed Hardeman, and we're thankful that we get to share in the Lord's work. We're thankful for the good things that happen here. I appreciate Dakota's kind words. Appreciate Jeremy and some of the others that are leading here and doing great things. I was mentioning earlier, a few years ago, I was blessed to serve as sort of an external reader on something that Crowley's Ridge was working on at the time. And I got to read through that, and I was so impressed, and am so impressed, by the great things that you're doing here, and more importantly, the great things that God's doing here. And I just am so encouraged and thankful for you. Uh, I love this place, and I love you, and I love the Word of God, and I'm thankful that we get to study together tonight. What a great thing. You know, it's easy to overlook those short epistles at the end of the New Testament, but we shouldn't. We should give thanks that every word of God's Word is breathed out and inspired and profitable. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. But I want to begin tonight with a bit of a personal question. Given what our theme is on the lectures this year, and given what we're going to be thinking about in tonight's lesson in particular, I wonder, when's the last time we heard a lesson on assurance? We sing Blessed Assurance. Well, do we believe that we have blessed assurance? I heard about a young man who was a camp counselor for several summers. He had the oldest boys in his cabin. Most of those young men were Christians. They had been baptized. And so every week at camp, he would do a bit of an experiment. Now, follow me here because this is going to sound suspicious. But he would give every young man in his cabin three poker chips. I know that sounds bad. Red, white, and blue. And it had nothing to do with the United States. He said he wanted those young men to think about their spiritual state, their salvation. And he wanted them to think about that for just two or three days. And at the end of that period, he would meet with them one-on-one. -on -one. He, he said as he began this experiment, hey, if you're thinking about your soul and you know that you are secure and you are, you are right with God and everything is as it should be, will you give me the white poker chip that represents security and purity and salvation? And at the end of this period, you're concerned about your soul and you're just not sure that things are what they ought to be. You're, you're pretty confident that you're lost. Would you, at the end of this period, give me the red poker chip? Well, you can imagine then what the blue chip was for, right? He said that at the end of that two or three day period, he wanted every young man that wasn't sure that if you were to ask them, are you saved? Are you right with Jesus? Are you, are you safe in the arms of God? If they, if they answered that question, you know, I'm not really sure. We're talking about young men who have been baptized. Young men who were faithful to the Lord, many of whom have been raised in, in godly families. You know what he said? That at the end of several years, he got almost exclusively blue chips. Now look, I understand that. I understand that we want to be humble. I understand that we recognize that 21 of the 27 books of the New Testament speak explicitly about the possibility of falling away from the faith. And we want to take sin seriously, and we want to walk circumspectly and think about our state, our spiritual state. But on the other hand, do we believe in security? You know, if you were to think about tonight's lesson, living securely in a precarious world, if we think that, first of all, I don't have to talk about the world being precarious. I don't have to highlight how bad the world is. Don't you hate it sometimes in sermons? When preachers go on and on about how bad the world is, we know that. We're not here to hear bad news. We're here to hear good news. We want to hear the gospel of Jesus. And so we know the world is precarious. The question is, how can we find security? And the word of God makes clear, although I love our men and women who serve in the armed forces, that security is ultimately not going to come through political alliances. It's not going to come through military strength. God warned the children of Israel, some trust in horses and some trust in chariots, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. And so if we're looking for security and what we might be able to protect, 
a military might or by trusting in government. We respect the government. We pray for those in positions of authority. We want them to be successful. We understand what Romans 13, 1 through 7 and 1 Peter 2 and other passages say about the right of government. The government can't save you. Riches can't save you. Education can't save you. Whatever it is that we think is going to provide security, if it's outside of the scope of God's love and what Christ has revealed, it will not provide security. I remember a few years ago sitting at the feet of a professor by the name of Michael Moss. And although the cursive script on this book might be difficult to read, it's a study of 1 John titled, Lord, Sometimes I Don't Feel Saved. I think there are a lot of people, when you ask them, who've been faithful to the Lord for many years, are you saved? Are you secure? They would say, well, I sure hope so. Well, while I want to be hopeful and while I want to be humble and I want to be optimistic about what it is our God has promised, if Christians can't have security, who can? If we can't have blessed assurance, who can? We want to put our faith in God. Dr. Moss talks about extremes. He highlights the fact that while we often warn against this idea that once you're saved, you're always saved, and we certainly want to be aware of the fact that you can fall from grace. The perseverance of the saints doctrine, as many have espoused it, is misleading and difficult. But on the other end of the spectrum, isn't it just as dangerous to teach, never really sure I'm saved? To be so uncertain about God's promise, to be so uncertain about the power of Jesus' blood, to be so uncertain about the future that the world looks at us, looks at us and they say, why would I want to be a Christian? You seem just as lost and confused as anyone else. And so that's one reason why I love 1 John. And don't get me wrong, I love 2 John and 3 John, but tonight's text is from 1 John. And in 1 John, we learn that this is a letter about Jesus. And it seems that many people in John's day, in Asia Minor, we believe where he was ministering, it's connected to what he says in Revelation and what's said previously in the Gospel according to John, that in this brief epistle, He's continuously calling people back to Jesus for a reason. Perhaps paralleling that purpose statement at the end of John's Gospel, in John 20, verses 30 and 31, where John highlights how the Spirit of God has been selected in compiling this Gospel account. You remember what Jesus, what Jesus does in John and what John says about Jesus in John? When he says many of the things Jesus did in the presence of many witnesses, but these have been written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing in a life in His name. And then is it no surprise that when we go to 1 John, it's a similar purpose, a similar challenge. It's a different reason. It's in a particular setting where it seems that these Christians that John is addressing in 1 John are dealing with a lot of challenges. But, but in 1 John 5 and verse 13, one of the verses we've been assigned to look at tonight, John, by inspiration, makes it clear that he's writing these things that his readers... Readers he knew, readers he loved, readers, readers he respected, that they might know that they have eternal life because they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Why would that be so challenging? Well, I believe, just as is the case in 2024, there were many Christians who have been taught accurately. They knew the will of God, and they knew the Word of God, and they trusted in the power of God, but they were struggling with their assurance with certainty. And look at that language. If you've got a Bible, you're going to note not only in 1 John chapter 5 and verse 13, but in 1 John chapter 2, the text that we're going to be spending most of our time in tonight, the word no shows up there an awful lot. In 1 John 2 and in 1 John 3, we see this repeated again and again. But notice how frequently the word no shows up in 1 John chapter 2. There's a reason. These Christians are struggling with what they can really know. Can I really know that I know Jesus? Why would this have been a big deal? I try not to put too much material on one slide, but I'm going to fail in that on this slide because this is the background of 1 John on one slide. When you read 1 John, there's a clear contrast between those who are among the saved, those who are with John, those who believe in Jesus, the us, the insiders, and throughout 1 John, John's trying to reassure them that Jesus Christ really did come in the flesh. Do you remember how this epistle begins? John recalls the things that they had seen and touched and looked at 
There's empirical evidence, John says, that Jesus really did come and live in the flesh. John says, in effect, if you know the Jesus I know, you know Jesus. And so throughout 1 John, what does he say? Well, if you have fellowship like we have fellowship, if you accept what we've taught from the beginning, you really know the Jesus who walked this earth. You know the truth. You then show that truth in the way that you serve others, much like Jesus himself talks about. In Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you visited me. I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was naked, and you clothed me. All of those good deeds aren't just good deeds for the sake of loving our fellow man. They're reflecting the love of Jesus. John says those are the folks who really know Jesus. They practice what they preach. They don't just talk it. They walk it. They live it. And the world knows the world's better because God's people are living as Jesus would have them to live. Those insiders know, know to stood for truth. They took hold of the things they had heard from the beginning. One of the big questions, right? I mean, John's gospel begins this way. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same as in the beginning with God. Is John talking about the same beginning here? Is he talking about creation? Or is he talking about when these Christians first heard the truth? Well, there's a, a variety of opinions on that question. But I believe what John's saying is the gospel hasn't changed. You know, as Paul reminds his readers in Galatians 1, 6-9, I'm perplexed, I'm disappointed. That so quickly you've turned aside to something different that's not really even the gospel. John says, hey, if you know the Jesus I know, if you know the Jesus that I spent three years with, during his Galilean ministry, do you really know Jesus? But then there's a group that Raymond Brown in his Anchor Bible Commentary on the Epistles of John calls the secessionists. Now this has nothing to do with the war between the states. I don't want anybody to get confused. But we're talking about those who pulled away from the church. They pulled away from God's people. And notice that John speaks with love about them. He's concerned about their salvation. He wants them to be saved. By the way, God wants all people to be saved. That comes with knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 4. So we see the heart of God in John. But John says, hey, those who are not with Jesus, those who are not a part of God's people, the body of Christ, what are they doing? Well, yeah, they were once faithful, but now they're speaking deceit. They're trying to mislead others. Namely, that's why in 1 John 2, 18, they're called the Antichrist. Well, people go wild with conspiracy theories when you start talking about the Antichrist. I, I'm amazed how in New Testament studies sometimes, we take all the bad guys from various passages, and we put them in a big bowl and mix it together and want people to believe contextually that all the bad guys in the New Testament are the same. That's not true. And in 1 John 2, 18, the reason these guys are called bad guys is because they've denied the very basic, fundamental aspect of the Christian faith, that Jesus Christ came in the flesh, and he walked among us. Sounds a lot like John 1 and verse 14. He came in the flesh, and we beheld his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of God, full of grace and truth. He came and he tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent among us. Some were denying that. In 2 John 9 through 11, we're told that's the basis of the discipline that John told those Christians that, a, that elect lady and her sister to enact. Because unfortunately, when you forsake Christ, you've forsaken the faith. That's what this group had done. They were speaking things that were false. They were deceived by the father of deceit, Satan himself, who wanted them to deny the very foundation of the faith. And so as we read 1 John, you get this balance. The balanced approach to the gospel. Let's be balanced in our presentation of the truth. Let's make sure that everyone takes sin seriously. I know anytime someone preaches on assurance, that's the concern. Are we taking sin seriously? Well, absolutely. Sin is destructive. And it's not just destructive spiritually. It's destructive psychologically. It destroys relationships. It's impacted the earth ever since Genesis 3. But while we take sin seriously, may we also take salvation seriously. May we acknowledge that God he is powerful and that he keeps his promises. And while we are sinners and we fall short of the glory of God, in 1 John 1, 7, we're reminded of that picture that we can walk in the light as he is in the light and have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from our sins. Talk about blessed assurance. As I walk 
faithfully in light of the Lord's grace. He's with me. He holds my hand. He guides me along the way. He's promised to never forsake me or fail me. Others may, but God will not. As we zoom in on our text tonight, in 1 John chapter 2, notice the pattern here. First of all, notice, as I've already mentioned, how many times the word know is used. Now, in Greek, there's a couple of different verbs that are being used interchangeably here. But I think throughout this text, the same emphasis is, is at the forefront of the, of the passage. In verse 3, notice how in 1 John 2 and verse 3, this text begins. By this we know that we have come to know him. Here's the question. Do you really know Jesus? John says, by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Two commands, two exhortations by the Spirit of God through John when he's talking here about the question. I think there are lots of Christians tonight struggling with this question. How do I know that I'm really in Jesus? Is it Bible knowledge? Hey, look, I like Bible knowledge. 2 Timothy 2.15, we want to study to show ourselves approved as true workmen of God. We're not going to deny Bible study, but you can memorize the whole Bible for sake God. I remember on a Wednesday night growing up in Columbia, Tennessee, there was a guy who came in, and I don't know why he did this, but I was probably about 11 years old, and I remember this. He started quoting the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, and about 15 to 20 minutes into that lesson, he was through Matthew 7, and he kept going. And I'm looking around for the guy with the cue card in the back. I'm looking for an earpiece, but there's nobody feeding this guy scripture. He has memorized almost the entire Gospel of Matthew. And I was sitting there thinking, I want to be like him. I want to have that photographic memory. I want to be able to quote scripture like he is. I need to get his number and get advice from him. And I don't bring this story up to be discouraging, but that brother who quoted almost the entire Gospel of Matthew within a year had left his family and left the church. You know, I, I want to know the Word, but knowing the Word alone does not mean that I'm secure. I can know the facts and not have faith. Even Satan quotes Scripture. And so this idea of obeying the Lord's commandments has nothing to do with Bible Bowl, with all due respect, and has everything to do with obedience. You know, commands are, are mentioned 14 times in 1 John. And I know that sometimes we bristle when we see the word commandment. We think about the 10 words of Exodus or Deuteronomy 5. We think about legalism and what it is that Paul was battling in epistles like Galatians. This is not legalism. This is tied to relationship. We see this frequently, especially in the farewell discourse of John 14, 15, and 16. Notice, as you're reading through that text sometime, how frequently relationship is connected with obedience. How often do we cite Roman, excuse me, John 14, 15? If you love me, relationship, you will keep my commandments. Isn't it sad that sometimes in our brotherhood we, we act as if, well, it's either rules or relationship. You either pay attention to what the Lord says or you want a relationship. And that false dichotomy doesn't exist in the New Testament. It's a both-and proposition. Those who deny Jesus were saying, hey, we know Jesus better than you do. We, we know what it was really like. He, he wasn't really in the flesh. And we think the reason they believe that is because they associated anything material with sort of earth and, and flesh and fallenness. Sort of an incipient Gnosticism of sorts. Maybe denying the very essence of Jesus' identity as both spirit and flesh. But in doing so, they had forsaken the faith. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? Now let's be careful that we don't just make a list of rules. You know, there are rules in the covenant that I've made with Christy. 25 years ago today, can I tell you a quick story? Who's going to say no? I told you, please don't. But 25 years ago today, I had a ring in my pocket. And we were walking across the campus of Freed Hardeman, and it was time to propose to Christy Johnson. And that ring was burning a hole in my pocket. And my plan, if you're familiar with the campus, was to get to Bradfield, where she lived. But I couldn't wait that long. 
and I just hit a knee. We waited for some person to pass by, and I finally asked her, will you marry Now, the pause, I felt like I had to wait forever for her to say anything. She said yes, but uh, the place I proposed to her is at the bottom of the cafeteria where there's a sliding door where they take the garbage out every day. <laughs> Today I walked through there and I thought, you know, I doubt many people have had romantic moments at the garbage dump at Gano Home. But she said yes, and the Lord blessed us in that relationship anyway. I don't know why I told you that story, but I feel better. <laughs> you know, if we, if we think about, I know why, because if we just think about the rules of a relationship, well, I'm supposed to be faithful to you because I have to. No, I want to. Because she's the only person in my life that I've made that covenant with. I don't have to, I want to. I want to honor her. You know, we were trained to think about marriage from a system called his needs, her needs. Anybody familiar with that? Where it, it's a good thing, I suppose, where you make this list of what she likes and what you like, and, and the metaphor is one of banking. It's kind of weird. Make more deposits than withdrawals. And so I had that list early in our marriage. Ooh, she likes affection. And she likes financial security, and she likes recreational companionship. And before long, you know what you do when you're, when you're viewing a relationship in that way? You're keeping score. And you know why score keeping is dangerous? Because if I'm honest in my relationship with her, or more importantly, in my relationship with God, I'm always behind. Always. And so rather than viewing our relationship as a financial transaction, or some kind of odd exchange of needs, I view my service to her as a part of my service to God. And John says here, hey, if you want to really know Jesus, live like Jesus called us to live. And while you're doing that, test the claims of those who are saying otherwise. In this same letter in 1 John 4, verses 1 through 3, John says to test the spirits. To be careful, to be discerning. That doesn't mean that we're paranoid, but he's warning here about the fact that even now there are all kinds of messages being propagated in our world. And some of them are shiny, and they smell good, and they look good, and they taste good, and they feel good. And so surely if a lot of people are bowing down at that idol, I should too. And the Lord says, don't. Don't buy the lie. Wide is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to life. John says, obey and test. And as he says that, notice what else. I love this pattern. We read through verse 6, but it really goes down through verse 9. If you like to write in your Bible or circle things or underline things, notice the pattern here. The one who says, verse 4. The one who says, verse 6. The one who says, verse 9. This parallels 1 John 1, 6 through 10 pretty closely with regard to what people claim versus what people do. And notice what was going on. Here's a group of people who were claiming some things, but they weren't practicing it. Their walk didn't match their talk. 1 John 4 says there were some who were saying, I know him, but they weren't obeying him. And as a result of that, the sad result is they were liars. They weren't representing the truth. Verse 6 reminds us that there were some who say, I, I abide in him. That word abide is used 10 times in 1 John. It's one of John's favorite words in the Gospel of John. Remember John 15, I'm the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, he who remains in me. He's talking about nourishment and sustaining. The sustaining power of God's love and grace and mercy. John says, if you're going to claim that, you better walk it. You better live it. And then down in verse 9, we didn't even read this verse, but he says, some say he is in the light and he hates his brother. And as a result of that, he's in the darkness. Jesus would ask, how can you hate the one that you do see and love the one that you don't see? Part of our love for God is reflected in the way we treat other people. And 1 John is a letter all about Jesus that calls us back to the reality that we ought to love like Jesus. Here's the warning. John says, don't be like these people. Don't put up a billboard saying you're faithful and then you mistreat your neighbor and you reject the poor. And you don't have mercy on the sinner. You don't show any compassion towards those when God has shown incredible compassion to you. Don't you remember how much debt you've been forgiven? And as a result of that, you should go and do likewise. And love your brother. Love your neighbor. Love your enemy. You know, as we think about this reality, I just want to highlight two big truths. 
First of all, I've already noticed this. Sin is serious. And the consequences of sin are deadly. Sin is the enemy. It should be avoided at all costs. And so that's why in Romans 6, we are familiar with verses 3 and 4. But remember what Paul says there. Should we continue in sin that grace may abound? May it never be. Why? We're dead to sin. Remember in 1 Corinthians 10 where Paul interacts with the text of Numbers and he uses a lot of imagery and language from that, that book of Moses, but he gets to a point where he highlights how he who thinks he stands better take heed lest he fall. Those examples of old demonstrate that even those who were with God in the wilderness and saw the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, and they had the manna and the quail and the bitter water turned sweet and the Red Sea parted, even those people sometimes struggle to stay true to their faith. Or maybe most famously, Hebrews chapter 6. That picture of what it's like to have tasted, been enlightened by the gospel, and even though you've experienced that sweet salvation and what happens, you fall away. You leave your first love. You abandon the one who brought you to that place of grace and hope. Sin is serious. But there's good news tonight. Salvation is serious too. Remember at the end of Romans chapter 8, the Apostle Paul lists 10 things there, I think in the context of a setting, the world's largest and most powerful city, or perhaps there were some Christians who were fearful that there were many things that might could separate them from the love of God in Christ. But he says, I'm convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That tells me the only way I can abandon faith is to walk away from Jesus. He will not walk away from me. That's why in Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, there's a command. Christians will be well served to remember this. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will reign in your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. That's security. I can't control what people do to me. I can't control what people think about me. I can't control what people say on social media, what people assume about God's people. But you know what I can control? The way I think about God. And because of that assurance, the way I think about the salvation I have. I think there's some people playing spiritual Russian roulette. It's a dangerous game to play. Which side of the line are you on? Well, it depends on how the day's been. It depends on what you did within the last 10 minutes. And listen, I want to take seri sin seriously, and I want to understand the consequence of, of violating God's will. But what if we thought about what 1 John claims, especially in passages like 1-7, 1 John 1-7, instead of saying, Lord, just help me down the right side of the line. What if we walk in the light as he is in the light? And that fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Lord, while I want to take sin seriously, help me to orient my life. Aren't you, aren't you disappointed that the word orientation has been hijacked by the world? When Christians ought to have a Christ-centered orientation, and every day, every moment, every thought, every action is, is being led towards honoring God in Christ Jesus. There's a better way to live. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. There's hope. So the question tonight is, well, how do I know? How do I know I'm saved? And I want to be careful with this because I think sometimes this can be dangerous. But in my own life, can I just share something personal with you? I've got a little spiritual inventory that I made up. Just some questions that I ask myself in a, in a self-evaluation of sorts. And it's not a fast fail. It's just a question of where's my wall? Where's my heart? I think the Christians in 1 John are struggling with this question too. So 12 quick questions. First, What's the orientation of my life? Am I moving towards God or away from God? Am I seeking His will or my own will? Do I acknowledge Him? Or has my conscience been seared? And I'm no longer sensitive to what it is that's happening in my life that might be pulling me away from God. Maybe it's a job. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's an idol. 
very end of this letter, what might be assumed by many to be a random verse. 1 John 5, 21, little children, keep yourself from idols. This is a letter all about idolatry, all about things that can take us away from God. Another question, do I depend daily on the blood of Jesus? In my daily prayers, in my daily meditation, in my Bible reading, in my association with other Christians, and maybe even those in the world, am I giving thanks daily? Even when someone cuts me off in traffic, even when someone in my family may smart off, even when I'm frustrated at work, even when I'm tired, even when I'm hungry, am I being motivated to honor Christ? A few more questions. Am I consistently striving to do God's will? Am I thinking about that even in moments of anger and frustration? Am I serving my brothers and sisters in Christ? Am I thinking more about others than myself? Does my relationship with God take precedence over other things in my life? Or are there things because I've compartmentalized my faith that are more important to me than Jesus? Just a few more. Do I abide in the doctrine of Christ? Healthy teaching that's oriented towards the will of God? Or am I making a Jesus in my own image and interchanging divine truth with what I want to be true? You might say, well, how can I allow God to work in my life? I can quench the Spirit. I can resist the will of God. I can make choices that dishonor Him. So am I really letting God work in my life? Am I habitually practicing righteousness or sin? Am I praying? Am I relying on the Spirit of God so that fruit can be made evident in my life on a daily basis? If these are things that I can answer in the affirmative, not because I'm trying to practice some kind of works-based salvation, but because I understand that connection to Jesus based on the content of 1 John 2, 3 through 6, 1 John 5, 13, is about obedience and testing what I'm being taught and desiring to walk more earnestly in the will of God. I wonder if every Christian here, before we go to bed tonight, before we think about what's on the ballot for tomorrow or on the agenda for tomorrow, if we might in Jesus say this prayer, not Lord, I sure hope I'm saved. Lord, I know I'm yours. I'm saved and I praise you for it. I thank you for your plan. I thank you for the truth that's spoken in a passage like Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. We're saved not by grace without faith, or by faith without grace, but we're saved by grace through faith. I want us to quit playing the spiritual Russian roulette. I want us to quit turning in the blue chip when someone asks us, hey, are you saved? And when we answer yes, it's not because we're so self-confident or we've given up on the seriousness of sin, but it's because in addition to taking sin seriously, we take salvation seriously. We have a blessed assurance. Let's live like those who've been saved and who long to be together in heaven. And in the meantime, live with confidence and treat others with respect because we know what a great God we serve. Aren't you thankful for our Savior Jesus and how he has redeemed us? I'm thankful for the faith that we share.
Thanks, and we give you honor in your son's most holy and precious name. Amen. Amen. 